Dr. Brian Carter is our speaker today. He is the senior pastor of Concord Church in Dallas, Texas. He has served as senior pastor for 18 years, currently serving over 9,000 members. Carter is a passionate leader with a vision for inspiring people to grow to their full potential in Christ. Innovative, strategic, compassionate, and visionary are just a few words used by others to describe his character. Carter leads with a, a focus on discipling others. He desires to see men grow in their walk with Christ and a passion for strengthening marriages by helping couples understand God's plan for their relationships. Concord Church continues to build on its great foundation and flourishes in helping people to grow in their spiritual lives and engaging in mission work in their local community and abroad. Dr. Carter and his wife, Stephanie, are proud parents of two daughters, uh, Caitlin and Kennedy, and one son. And Kennedy is here with us today. She is a junior at Oak Ridge High School. And uh, Kennedy, would you uh, wave at least and let us welcome you here today? She is a delightful young lady and also an athlete. So uh, would you welcome me with me today? <laughs> would you welcome me? I'll just take it from here. No. <laughs> would you join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Carter to our pulpit today? Thank you, Dr. Allen. What a, what a joy it is to be together and to gather around God's Word. It's always an honor uh, to be at Dallas Seminary, uh, given out, of course, to the faculty and staff and to the students and to the prospective students. It's an honor to be here because Dallas Seminary has been su played such a pivotal part in my life. I, uh, every time I drive to this campus, I have so many fond memories of the classes, of the friendships, relationships, and the incredible way God used seminary to help shape my life. And so it's a great, incredible place. And uh, uh, for all the perspective to thank you for considering Dallas Seminary. I hope you have a very short list with one on it, but we are very, very grateful uh, for all of those institutions there, but the DTS has meant the world to me. Family, would you pray with me for a moment? Lord, we come and we thank you for this moment just to consider your word. We thank you, Lord, for worship, we thank you, Lord, for your scriptures. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. And so it is, Lord, that as we consider your scriptures this morning, we pray that they may point us more and more to you. And we are grateful indeed. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. amen. Well, several years ago, a couple in our church, after getting married, longed to have a child. And they never expected that having a child would bring so many challenges. They would suffer through several challenges with infertility as they longed to be parents. They tried in vitro, tried treatments, and through everything, things simply did not plan out the way they thought they would. And then one day, they would reach out to me and say, Pastor, we've decided to adopt and would you please be a reference for us as we go through this adoption process? And so they began the adoption process, navigating through this process, longing to bring home the child that they had waited for for several years. And then I won't forget the very day that they finally received their daughter. <laughs> their daughter would come home and they would be so excited as they finally received what they had learned to patiently wait for. <laughs> What I admired about this incredible couple was the amazing ability that they put on display about how to patiently wait on God. I watched them as they went through highs and lows and difficulties that they faced until finally they were able to bring home this daughter that they had longed for. Friends, it is this ideal of waiting and this willingness to wait that is an essential skill of the Christian life. That no matter where we are, no matter where we are in our juncture, in our journey of following Christ, waiting is a prerequisite for how we will grow into maturity. 
It happens in all of our lives, whether we are waiting for a, a decision or waiting for clarity in our lives or waiting for a ministry opportunity or, or waiting for a relationship to get better or waiting for clarity to happen about someone that you're in a relationship with. Waiting is a non-negotiable. Waiting for the right relationship or waiting for something to get better or waiting for graduation or waiting for spring break. <laughs> waiting is something that we all are incredibly familiar with. If there's anyone that ever understood waiting, there is a man by the name of David in 1 Samuel chapter 24 that gives us an exhibit A demonstration of what it means to wait on God. It is his ability to wait on God that I believe gives us, a, gives us instruction and gives us encouragement about how we manage it in all of our lives. So for a few moments, I want us to consider this topic, God's waiting room from 1 Samuel chapter 24. And I believe that as we look into David's life today, that we will discover that waiting on God is always worth it. 1 Samuel chapter 24, allow me to read the chapter in its entirety. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told that David is in the desert of En Gedi. And so Saul took 3,000 able young men with all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep pens Along the way, a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. And David and his men were far back in the cave. And the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And then David crept up unnoticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. And then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed down, prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. And some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointing. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me and my Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause, uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. And when David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have now, just now, told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. And when a man finds his enemy, does he not let him stay, let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me. I know that you will truly be king and the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me my, by my Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul and then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. We understand that David was anointed in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And then in 1 Samuel 17, he defeats the giant Goliath. At that point, Saul offers and welcomes David to live with him and to stay with him. And there, David leads military battle after military battle. And, and David is so successful in his military conquests that, they, that the women of the city make up the song that Saul has slain his thousands while David has slain his ten thousands. 
And so Saul becomes angry and becomes jealous and attempts to kill David. And so David ends up going on the run. He runs to Gath and Adullam and Mespah and Kelion. And, and David keeps running now. He is living in the En Gedi. He is there in that desert place, hiding in caves, moving from place to place. He is on the run as he waits to be appointed as king. Some suggest that he, this waiting period was somewhere between 10 to 14 years. He is appointed king at 30, but throughout his 20s, he is running and he is waiting on God to make this final move. And while he's waiting, he has to manage this incredibly difficult and toxic relationship with Saul. And here when we meet Saul, we meet David in Samuel chapter 24. This one chapter is really reflective of 1 Samuel 18 through 31. That, that in, on multiple occasions, we find episodes where David is trying to negotiate his waiting period on God. And this scene in chapter 24 is one episode, but it really captures the entire essence of this waiting season as Saul continually takes attempts on his life. I want to offer to you just a couple of principles about what do we learn about waiting from David's life. Number one, we learn that waiting time is testing time. I mean, David here in, the, in this season of waiting, but it's also a season of testing. It's a season of testing where David's heart is being tested about whether or not he will really trust God for what God has promised him in his life. About will he trust God for the plan and for the work that God has in store? Here is David in this cave, and it just so happens that Saul comes into the same cave to relieve himself. And there is David in the background of this cave, and while he is there, Saul and David end up in this unique place with Saul being in a very vulnerable position. And there is David trying to figure out what to do in this moment where the person that has been pursuing him and the person that has been after him, he could literally take him out at this moment. This is a test on David's heart. Will, will, will David trust God's timing? Or will David take matters into his own hands? Will David listen to the men and to the people around him? Or will David listen to God? Will David give in to his natural inclination to seek revenge and to take his way? Or will David give in to the will and the authority and the power of God to trust God's timing, God's way, and God's manner? And friends, waiting time is testing time. And you will find yourself in those very moments where you're going to have to ask yourself the question, are you going to be petty or are you going to be purposeful? Are you going to be jealous or are you going to be joyful? Are you going to be grateful or are you going to begin to grumble? Are you going to be impatient or are you going to be intentional? Waiting will test your integrity. This is David's struggle. David is in this moment. He can choose to react or he can choose to wait and trust God's plan and God's will. This is what waiting does. Waiting always reveals your character. It's by the very nature. That's why you find it so consistently throughout the scriptures that God often allows his servants to navigate through waiting seasons because waiting often reveals character. You want to know who you're really dating? Just give them time. <laughs> because waiting will reveal character. Just, just give it time. It, it always does. It's in those moments. And, and there is David trying to figure out what to do, trying to negotiate what's going on. And, 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 and even when he cuts off a bit of the, of the robe, he, he immediately is convicted in his heart and, and he immediately confesses it. And then he goes back and says to them, no, I, I can't do this. This is not right. This is, this is not the right order. This is not what God has called me to do. I will not take into my hands what belongs in God's hands. And David is here, and David reminds us that waiting time is testing time. And perhaps that's what you're navigating through in your own life. 
But as you wait on a decision or as you wait on something you've expected to happen or as you wait on God's timing, that perhaps what God is doing is testing and developing your character. Maybe that's why there, it's over 120 hours that takes you to get this. Maybe there's this waiting period that God is testing you and developing you and preparing you and shaping you. Maybe it's because waiting time is also testing time. I want you to see, we see this here, but then he continues on in the text. And then we discover also that not only is waiting time, testing time. Not only is waiting time, but secondly, waiting time is also working time. Waiting time is also working time. It is, it is working time. I want you to notice that when, when David makes his decision to, to, to not take Saul into his hands, Around verse 6, David keeps saying the Lord, the Lord's anointed, the, the Lord. He uses the Lord three times. He uses this. He uses it to, to convey that, that David understands that where he is and what he is pursuing and where God is leading, that is not simply up to him. It's up to what God is doing in his life. It's what God is doing in his sovereign life, in, in his sovereign plan. It is one of the themes of this passage, and really one of the themes of the entire season of David's waiting is God's sovereignty. I mean, you do understand that it was no coincidence that God would allow Saul and David to end up in the same cave. That it is what by the divine sovereignty and providence of God that God would so position him in this space, in this moment, But what David came to understand is that the reason he could not take matters into his hand is because David has learned how to trust the sovereignty of God in his life and even in this very moment. He had to learn and rely upon the sovereignty and the work of God. And this God's sovereignty is an overarching theme and motif throughout his life. While Saul is convinced that there was a conspiracy plan, I mean, Saul says that he he just knows that someone is organizing against him, that someone is out to destroy him, that someone is out to undermine him. But what Saul doesn't understand is that this has all been God's sovereignty, that in all of God's sovereignty, it was God that would go and pick David, this shepherd boy, that it was God's sovereignty that he would allow and raise up this David. That it was God's sovereignty that would uniquely position David in this moment. And even in this waiting season, it is a reminder that God's sovereignty was still working. There we sat with a loved one as they were going through a medical procedure. And there while they were, we we got there that morning, sat with them until the doctor came to to walk through instructions and do the pre-op. And then we gathered their belongings, went out to the waiting room while they then rolled our loved one off to begin this medical procedure. And they would begin and continue that medical procedure while we sat in the waiting room. And while we sat in the waiting room, it was okay for a few moments because they say they will call you and give you an update on how things are going. But we became a little anxious as we sat there and as we thought about our loved one, seen one hour after another hour after another hour. And then somewhere in the midst of that, we begin to remind ourselves that while we were in the waiting room, the surgeon and the doctors were in the operating room. And while we were waiting, they were working. While we were waiting on the next steps, they were working and working and doing the surgery and doing the procedures and, and implementing all the strategies to bring our loved one to full health. And one of the things you and I must always understand is that while you're in the waiting room, God is in his workroom. And that while you are waiting on God to give you clarity, waiting on God to grant the favor, waiting on God to open the door, waiting on God for the opportunity, waiting on God for closure, you've got to understand that while you're still waiting, God is in his workroom in his sovereignty of his plan, and he is working in your situation. He is working in that situation. He is working all over the world and in all spaces at the same time. God's waiting room is God's work room. 
And sometimes we got to remind ourselves that he is working. This is a picture of what David navigates through as he travels throughout the En Gedi and goes from one place to another. He has to constantly remind himself, and his life teaches us that while he's working, while he's waiting, God is working. We went to Six Flags on one occasion. Well, my wife took our kids to Six Flags. I was away preaching at a ministry engagement, and they decided that they would go to Six Flags without me. And so they didn't go to church that day. They just went to Six Flags. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, I understand. And, uh, and then when we got the bill, there was an extra charge on the account. And uh, my wife said, listen, when you get the bill, just know there's an extra charge uh, because we decided to get a fast pass a as well. We, we, we decided we didn't want to sit in lines on this occasion. We just got a fast pass, and we were able to move to the front of every line that we went to. And I said, wow, that must be nice. I'm preaching y'all at Six Flags, <laughs> and you got a fast pass. That's okay. I, no, no hard feelings. But sometimes in life, don't you wish God had a fast pass? Don't you wish you could pay a little extra? pray a little extra and get a fast pass to move you to the front of the line. It doesn't exist in our lives, but we still got to rely on the fact that while we are waiting, God is working. Here it is. Here's number three is simply this. Not only is waiting time working time, but number three is this. Waiting time is not wasting time. I wonder that while David is navigating through this space. Have you ever asked himself, am I wasting time? I wonder, I wonder that as David is navigating through this 10 to 14 year period, that while navigating through his 20s of his life, when perhaps it might have been projected to be the peak when doors ought to be opening and things ought to be happening, that instead here he is going from place to place homeless, with a small band of warriors with him trying. And I wonder if he asked himself, am I just wasting time? I wonder if he ever struggled with, with this period of navigating through this. Because like him, there, there are many of us, even in this room too, that sometimes in the midst of our waiting, ask ourselves questions like, am I wasting time? Have I wasted these years or did I accomplish anything of significance? Or, or did I waste time on that project or waste time in that ministry assignment? Or did I waste time in that particular area or at that church or in that particular space or in that relationship? Did, 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 I, did, I, did I waste time? Did I, did, did, did I miss something? Did I, did I, was I just going through the motions? Was I just circling around in spaces? But there's something interesting about when you watch David as he navigates through that. And even in this very moment, and even as you look at the totality of this waiting season and this period of time where he is navigating through, that David never, David, David that God is not, his, his time is not wasted. As a matter of fact, if you look at it, even when he says, when Saul says that he has confidence that David will, that God will establish his hands that it is a picture of this reality that even Saul knows that God is working and moving and will use David in this next season. You got to understand, God wastes nothing. But God was not wasting the years away of David's life as he navigates through this season. That God wastes nothing. That God in his own sovereignty was using this season to prepare David for who God wanted David to be. But it is this waiting season that prepared David to be the king to which God would call him to be. God knew the kind of heart and the kind of person and the kind of king that David needed to be. And so God allowed these seasons of waiting to shape and to form David's heart and David's life. And God knew the kind of king that Israel needed. And so God was both preparing them for who God needed. Waiting time is not wasting time. Be careful because the enemy loves to tempt us, and loves to make us think that we have wasted seasons of our lives. 
But because of God's sovereignty and because of God's providence and because God knows both beginning and God knows end, we can trust that God wastes nothing. But we can know that the God that we serve is using every season, every win, every loss, every cave, every kingship, every sheep, every shepherding, every season, every moment, that there is not a moment in David's life that God is wasting. No, but God is using it to shape him into God who God needs and desires for him to be. There, during my seminary years, I remember having lunch with Dr. Mark Bailey on an occasion because I was a bit torn about where God was leading me, a bit torn about managing. When I was in seminary, I was in full-time ministry, had a couple of young kids, our first child, and it was stressing me out. It was a lot to manage between home life and ministry and coursework. And I remember Dr. Bailey and I having lunch on an occasion and sitting there and him giving me just wise counsel. Him coaching me to see the long-term picture and, and to trust God one semester at a time and to not allow, as difficult as some seasons may be, he gave me great advice and great counsel about trusting God one class at a time, one season at a time, because you never know where God wants to take you. So just be faithful, Brian, in the moments, in the scenes, in the seasons, because God is using it all. It's there in our neighborhood once a week that uh, our neighbors put out these green bins there on the corner of the streets. And there in them are paper and cardboard and plastic materials that are then picked up by the local city that then takes those old items and then, <laughs> and then those old items that have been discarded are taken to the recycling plant where they are then shaped into something new. These old, discarded, seemingly useless pieces are then recycled into something productive, recycled into something new. In a very similar way, you and I must always remember that God uses every season of our lives. He takes seasons that you didn't think would matter, seasons where you thought you won. He puts them all in his recycling bin. And then he mixes in, of course, his Holy Spirit, his power, his sovereignty, and his grace. And he produces out of every season something greater than it was when we were in that season. Waiting time is not wasting time. And then finally, this one and I'm done. Waiting time is worshiping time. I mean, how do you spend your waiting time is everything. How you spend your waiting season is everything. And while David is waiting, he's writing. And he writes some of his most significant psalms while he's in this season of his life. It is in this very season of his life, when he has no place to call home, that he writes Psalm 18 and Psalm 34 and Psalm 52 and Psalm 54 and 56, 57 and 63 and 124 and 138 and 142. Some eight to nine psalms are, are written in this season while he's waiting. That almost, almost, uh, uh, almost 10 to 15 percent of all the psalms that he would write would be captured in this waiting season. Psalms like Psalm 56, where he would say words like this, Be merciful for me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you and God in God whom I praise, in God whom I trust, and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Or Psalm 57 where he says, Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Or, or, or consider uh, Psalm, Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. 
earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole longing being longs for you in a dry parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your glory, your power and your glory because your love is better than life and my lips will glorify you. Or, 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 or consider Psalm 142, 142 where he says, I cried aloud to the Lord. I lifted up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I poured out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who will watch over my way in the past where I walk. People have hidden a snare for me. What's interesting is Paul, I mean, as David captures this, it's as though David has his journal with him as he walks and through this season of waiting. And he is penning these psalms and writing back to God. And what I love about all of these psalms is that David is free to express his emotions. That, that David doesn't try to temper his emotions as he navigates through the season. But he brings his frustration and he brings anger and he brings desperation and loneliness and he brings praise and faith and expectation and he brings all these to God. I think it models for us that that's how we wait. That's the proper posture of one waiting on God. That the proper posture is in a posture of worship. And in that worship, you can bring wherever you may be in your waiting season. That perhaps you're waiting on the doctors to, to tell your loved one they are cancer-free. Or perhaps you're waiting on a relationship to get better. Or perhaps you're waiting on the Lord to send a relationship that you long for. Or perhaps you're waiting on graduation or, or, or waiting on clarity or waiting on a ministry opportunity. And you've, you've seen others, but you are waiting on the one that you've prayed for. And yet as you walk through that season, this, David's example teaches us that in our, in our waiting, we must worship. And in our worship, we must trust him by bringing our disappointment and our faith and our desperation. But at what you notice about these psalms that he writes, they always, or many times, they also have a sense of expectancy in many of them. That despite what he's going through, he keeps holding on to an expectation of what God is able to do for him and through him. He holds on to his belief. And perhaps that's what you need to consider doing this week. That as you think about what you are waiting for and what you are expecting God for a loved one that it needs to come to the faith or for a chance to go and do mission work, or for someone else you're trying to reach, maybe you need to go home this very week and begin to pen and write back to God and say, God, I'm trusting you for it. That God, it has not been easy. God, it has been challenging. God, the uncertainty has been incredibly difficult. But God, I am trusting you for what you're going to do, and I am trusting you for how you are going to work in my life and through my life. Waiting time is worshiping time. Waiting time is testing time. Waiting time is working time. And waiting time is not wasting time. David's life and David's picture, this episode in his life, serves as a reminder and a picture of how to trust God in a moment and in a season of waiting. Whether that time is now or whether that time is to come, that he is a God that's always worth waiting for. That he is a God that has not forgotten about us. That he is a God that has a sovereign plan that he is working. That he is the same God that called you from the very inception. That, that put the call of ministry on your heart and life to teach, to study, to prepare for full-time ministry. That same God is the same God that in the midst of your waiting has and knows exactly where he wants to lead you in life, in ministry, in seminary, and the future that lies ahead. He is worth waiting for. And I close by telling you about another moment in our lives when my family and I were, were, were there waiting at a restaurant of our faith, of a restaurant that we love to go to. And, and there we were as we, as we got to the restaurant, we, I went up to the maitre d' and I, I put our name on the list. It was, it's five of us in our family and we were there waiting and, and it just seemed as though it was taking so long. I couldn't understand why it was taking so long. Couldn't understand why things, people kept going in front of us. 
And you know how sometimes you can sit and start counting. You just start counting. You say, we were here before them. We were here before them. I, I, I don't get this. Why in the world are, are people continuing to go in front of us? And I, just, I couldn't take it any longer. I said, listen, let me go ask the matron. So I politely, I went up to the matron. I said, listen, I, I, I'm just trying to understand how is it that we were here before all of them. With those last three people, we were here before them, and we're, we're still waiting. Do you have any idea how much longer it would be? He would then say to me, Mr. Carter, you must understand that, that those individuals that have gone in front of you, uh, they had a smaller party. They had a party of two all of them, you have a party of five. And it's going to take us a little longer to get your table ready because you have such a large party. So if you just, just remain patient with us, we've got to, there, there are not as many tables there, so it's going to take us a little while longer before we can get the table ready for your party of five. So just remain patient. And I had to remind myself, Brian, stop looking at everybody else's pace. Stop looking at everybody else's moment. Stop looking and measuring your t- appointment by someone else's appointment. Just stay where you are. You guys are going to need a bigger table. It's going to take them a little while longer. And sometimes in your own life, you must remind yourself you don't need to look at anybody else's table, anybody else's pace, anybody else's performance, anybody else's assignment, anybody else's accomplishments. No, no, no. Instead, understand this, that, that, that God has a table that, that, that may take a little while longer. It may, it may take a few more months. It may take a few more years. It may take a few more seasons. But what you've got to understand, because he's sovereign, he knows exactly the kind of table, the kind of situation, the kind of moment, the kind of situation the kind of uh, of circumstance where he wants to position you. And if you just remain faithful to him, understand this, he is a God that's always worth waiting for. Let us pray. Father, we come today and we bear our hearts before you that we long to be faithful to wherever you plant us. That in this room, since prayers and desires and passions that you've called us to, situations in our families and our in our careers and our studies, and Lord, we just surrender it all to you. We surrender our timetables, we surrender the locations, we surrender the, the people. Like David, we give it all to you. And we commit the trust that waiting on you is always worth it. So, Father, we're going to wait on you. (laughs) Even if it means sometimes we got to do it alone, we're going to wait on you. Even if it means that sometimes it doesn't quite make sense to us, we're going to wait on you. Even when it looks like enemies are making progress, we're going to wait on you. Even when it feels like we're wasting time and not really making much progress, we're going to wait on you. And so, Father, we do declare that you are faithful, that you are gracious, that you are sovereign, that you are providential. And so we're going to wait on you. Through the sickness of a loved one, we'll wait on you. Through a relationship that we long to be healed, we'll wait on you. Through whatever it is, we will trust you because we know that you are faithful. We know that you are worthy. We know you have not forgotten and we know that you are working while we wait. So, Father, I thank you. And I present each of us at, our, at your altar today. And I ask you, O oh God, to do your work and help us to be faithful in every moment and in every season and in every situation. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.